Here, we have the Ubiquiti Nanobeam 5AC Gen 2. Ubiquiti's products in their AirMax lineup are very popular with small wireless internet service providers and other companies that need to cheaply extend networks around. Their ecosystem is well-rounded and the software is pretty friendly. They have a straightforward user interface that can be accessed with both a web browser or their UISP smartphone app. This model isn't the cheapest of theirs, but it's one of their nicer form factors. It's unobtrusively designed, and it has a mount that can be attached to a wall or post with a single screw. This mount also allows it to tilt or rotate in any direction on its ball socket mount. On the back, there's a built-in level to help you install it, well, level. And on the side, there's some status LEDs. On the bottom, there's two gigabit network ports. The second can also be used to power another device that supports 24 volt passive PoE, like some outdoor Wi-Fi access points or a second Wi-Fi bridge. It uses the 5 GHz band, though Ubiquiti also makes a 2.4 GHz model for the same price if you have some line of sight issues. The antenna is pretty high gain for its size at 19 dBi. As for accessories in the box, you get a 24 volt passive PoE injector with a wall mount bracket and a hose clamp for pole mounting. I do wish they had also thrown in a long screw and maybe some anchor plugs for mounting it into a wood or concrete wall. The Nanobeam 5AC Gen 2 goes for 132 Canadian dollars each or 264 for a pair. This is on the low side for ISP focused equipment, but definitely not as cheap as you can go for a PTP bridge. We'll set up this pair with a laptop, but you can also download the UISP app and configure it with an Android or iOS smartphone. We're going to set up the access point side first, so we'll connect the first unit to its PoE injector and then connect the other port on the injector to the laptop's Ethernet port. On the laptop, we'll go into the network settings and set a static IP address of 192.168.1.5 on the Ethernet port. Then open a web browser and type in the Nanobeam's default IP address of 192.168.1.20 into the address bar, then hit the enter key. After dismissing the certificate error, we'll be prompted to enter a username and password used for logging into it. Then we'll click Save. You'll be brought to the dashboard, which won't show much at the moment since there's no wireless link yet. We'll go into the wireless settings and turn on access point mode, then turn on PTP mode. For the channel width, this will depend on the speed that you need out of it. Personally, I think 40 MHz is a good compromise and should give you around 300 megabits while still leaving plenty of room for your actual Wi-Fi networks. If you need more speed and aren't going longer distances, you can often find room for a full 80 MHz wide channel in the frequencies that require DFS and have lower power limits. For the SSID, pick whatever you want, you'll just have to enter it into the second nanobeam when we get to that part. Select the country you live in. For the output power, you can max this out if you're going a longer distance or through some light obstacles, but for short distances, you can start with about 15 and that's going to be plenty. When everything is installed, you can fine tune this to get the received signal to a good value like around 55 dBm or so. In the wireless security area, we'll set up a WPA2 pre-shared key, which can be anything at least 8 characters long. Then we'll turn on automatic power control and just set that to negative 55. Next we'll go to the network settings. We'll give this one the first free IP address on our home network and fill in the rest of the details. We'll then turn off auto IP aliasing and IPv6 since they're not something we're using to manage the device. You can optionally go into the services menu and shut off HTTPS on the web server if you find dismissing the SSL warning every time is getting annoying. At the bottom here, we'll click save changes to apply all those settings. I can get to it from the new IP address since I'm still within the 192.168.1 network that I set on the laptop's ethernet port. But if the IP you picked for your home network is in a different IP address range, you may have to change your laptop's IP address or connect it to your home network to get back in. We'll keep this nanobeam running and set it aside while we connect the second one to its PoE injector, then connect it to the laptop. Once again, we'll load up the default IP address of 192.168.1.20 and go through the same country and language setup. Then put in a new username and password. We'll hop over to the wireless settings and turn on PTP mode. Then enter in the SSID and WPA2 key that you set in the other nanobeam. You can leave the output power alone since it should adjust automatically. In the network settings, we'll set it to a second unused static IP, and once again, turn off auto IP aliasing and IPv6. We can click the Save Changes button, and after a few moments, the browser should redirect it to the new IP address where we can log back in. 
If the two bridges are set up right, we should see them connected on this dashboard. They may take a minute to connect, or a little longer if you're using a frequency that requires DFS to do its check on the channel that you selected. This dashboard has a lot of useful information. It'll tell you the estimated capacity of the link, the rough distance, the signal level on both sides, and some shiny graphs of the capacity and the amount of data flowing through it. To test out the nano beams, I set them up about 40 feet away from each other, with a laptop running iPerf 3 on each side. The signal strength, even with the bridges automatically dialing back their transmit power, is very strong due to the good antenna that Ubiquiti put in there. Starting an iPerf test, I'm seeing an average of 196 megabits, which is pretty good. Changing it to an 80 MHz wide channel gets an average of 189 megabits, despite the status page claiming a doubling in capacity. After running Ping Tracer for a couple minutes to check the latency, it seems very good with an average of 1 millisecond and no dropped packets. The power consumption seems to idle at about 3.5 watts, and under load we see it jump to about 5.6 watts. This is a little higher than other products, which might be due to the secondary Wi-Fi chip in the Nano Beam used for the Spectrum Analyzer and the phone app access, though it's still pretty low. Ubiquity Nano Beam is an all-around good PTP bridge. The performance is good, the antenna and transmit power allow the signal to travel far distances, the mounting design is one of my favorites due to its flexibility, and the configuration experience is pretty friendly. These devices are used all over the place in large numbers for fixed wireless internet service and for security camera systems. I've been using AirMax products from Ubiquiti for many years in an ISP setting, and their products seem to work well there. But as you'd expect, if you pay twice as much, or more, for other competing products, there's going to be something that performs better. For cost-sensitive projects, Ubiquiti AirMax is a pretty good value. Long-term support isn't bad, though Ubiquiti is a bit infamous for silently dropping support for products and not communicating roadmaps to their customers. The reliability of the products is often pretty good, and they do release updates to fix issues from time to time. I'm pretty confident in recommending the Ubiquiti Nano Beam to most people. There are definitely cheaper options out there if you're on a budget and don't need something super fast, but if you're looking for a solid performer that's easy to install, take a look at the Nano Beam.